work that we did raising this concern. Uh, so in our work, Swiss Knife, we introduced a new tool setting, which we call black box setting. This setting refers to the scenario where we are not provided with direct access to the API calls or their internal implementation, but we only have access to their tool descriptions. So basically, you are not you won't be able to execute the API. You won't be able to actually call them. You don't have any internal implementation, but you do have access to tool descriptions. So what do I mean, what do I mean by tool description? Let's take a look. Again, it's actually a real world example of a private API only. So there is a tool add work items to the sprint. Basically, there is some kind of sprint or you know current task going on, and you want to add your work items to it. So there are two argument values, uh, argument names, work ID, sprint ID. Work ID is the ID which refers to the item that you want to add. The sprint ID refers to the ID of the sprint to which you want to add your work. And argument type basically sprint ID is a string, and work ID can be an array of string. So uh, in this setting, you are provided with a tool name, description, argument name, and you know argument type. You don't have access to the calls, and you don't have any internal implementation. You just have description. So this is black box setting. Here you can see three different settings. In white box, you have uh, you have source code, which is the internal implementation. You have tool response. In gray box setting, you don't have source code and internal implementation, but you do have access to the API. You can uh, call the API. You can take the output. In block in black box setting, you don't either have uh, you know uh, access to API calls. You can't call them. You don't have source code or internal implementation. All you have is just descriptions. So how to do reasoning in the black box setting? So like the reasoning techniques, the most prominent tool LM reasoning techniques, React cannot be used here because there are no executable APIs. React thrive on the fact that you can actually get some action and get some observation. You don't have any observation here. You can't actually execute the API. Also, it accounts for high token count and excess API calls during exploration, resulting in you know cost. And other reasoning method, COT and QT, along with high token count, may I be able to plan at some level, but they are not very good in function calling. And COT doesn't perform well if you look at papers in comparison to the React. So you need a different approach here. So reverse chain comes in here. Uh, reverse chain was a paper introduced recently in 2024. So uh, reverse chain doesn't acknowledge the black box tool setting, but it is a planning method or reasoning method that can be applied in black box. So I'll like go through the reverse chain. So what happens in reverse chain is you select, start with the selection of final API. So basically you have a user task, you decide, okay, this is the final task. This is the final thing that I want to do. For example, let's take a query example here. Please help Jack book a meeting room for 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. So what is the final task? You can see the final task here is you know book a room. And you have an API, let's say book room. So you select book room as the final API. Now you will see the argument needs. So I told you you do have the uh, access to what is the what would be the argument, the names of the argument and the description. So basically, in this case, you know that there are four arguments here: personal ID, room ID, start time, and time. So basically, the start date, end date, personal person ID, room ID here. So now I told you that function calling, you need to fill the argument. It can be done in two ways. Either there will be some information in the query itself, or either it will be output of a previous function call. For example, here you can see start time and end time has been in the query, 9 a.m., 10 a.m. But you don't have person ID or room ID, you know. So basically, you will call, uh, there is an, another API that might help you here. So that's how reverse chain works. It's, it takes an API, uh, you know, API. It will fill the arguments first. For those which information is present in the query, it will fill the argument query from the query. For rest, it will, uh, you know, accept that there might be another API that will help in getting that argument value. For example, for person ID, there is an external API, API name to ID that can be used here. So, you know, it's working reverse uh, in a reverse manner. Uh, so the output of the previous function calls, uh, so it will determine which function that is that needs to be called. So here comes the API name to ID. Same for room ID comes the API recommended group. Now the argument that needs to be filled for API name to ID will be the person name. So basically from person name, you get the person ID. You have again person name you have in the query. For recommended room, you just need start time and end time. That info is present in the query. 
So see how reverse chain works. It doesn't execute APIs, but it plan, you know, in a reverse manner, it starts to finally pay selection and it fills in the arguments. It's not executing them, but it's in reverse manner filling the arguments of the API. So there are two tasks that it does at each step. It selects the API, what will be the relevant API at each step, and it will fulfill the arguments and then move in reverse manner. So it's a pretty good approach, I believe, for black box scenario. Uh, oh, uh, down here you can see the final API planning. So book room, person ID, for person ID, you needed name to ID and then the argument filling or function knowledge, person name, then room ID and you know, start time at that. So limitations, okay. There might be a case where there might be multiple final APIs. So not always user task is not always, you know, sequential. There might be multiple independent tasks. So in this case, there will be multiple final APIs. And reverse gen right now doesn't address such scenarios. It only believes that there is a sequential task and there is a single final API. So we have uh, faced some situations where there were multiple final APIs and, you know, uh, there will be an issue there. It might result in a really large token bound if you are generating a plan for all the final API and you know combining them. Again, that's the thing, high token count. Reversion again being a traversal based approach results in high token count and is less cost efficient. So, what might be the solution? So, we actually explored code driven reasoning in our work. We thought let's uh, you know transform this task of tool planning and function calling in code as a code generation task. And let's explore the code generation abilities of LLM. We designed an end to end framework that allowed for official tool planning and reasoning in suitable real world for suitable real world scenarios. So, first, I'll explain how uh, it works in the black box setting. And then I will show you like how it overcome all the real world limitations. So, the two main components that rise are approaches function signature and code driven planning. So, let's look into function signature. So, the main idea is you have your tool descriptions. You have name, you have descriptions, uh, you have arguments, you have argument names, their description, in some cases you are provided with some examples as well. So now the idea is take those tool description and generate function signatures. So basically what you are doing is you are generating pseudo APIs using the API descriptions. So here you can look at an example. So basically we had an API pairs same sum to zero. There's a description that it takes input as a list of integers and it returns true or false. So you can generate a function signature that looks like original function, but it doesn't actually execute anything. That's a uh, pseudo. If you execute it, it will return just a random uh, value or dummy dummy value. So you have pair sum to uh, zero. Uh, it goes to the function signature, basically, that the input format, the output format, and the return data type must be similar to the tool description. The name must be similar to the given name. Also, the talk string must match the tool description. Uh, the idea of including the talk string here is basically when you want to do the planning, code generation is planning, you want uh, to be LLM to be able to, you know, uh, get some semantic similarity between the query and the functions. So having that talk string there allows it to, you know, match those similarities. Again, the return data type and everything. So First, which what we do is we give in the tool description, generate the function signatures. Second, we give all this function, pseudo function and function signature to the LLM and ask it to generate a code driven plan. And code generation doesn't actually allow, ask you to you know necessitate API execution or anything while generating the code. So code generation happens in a one go. You are not individually executing those API. You then later on uh, execute the complete code together. So basically, it uh, is doing code generation is planning in black, black box setting itself. So for example, here was a query that, you know, it's a hypothetical query and there are pseudo functions. These are pseudo functions only. So you want to load the data regarding baby food preferences. You want to analyze the preferences across different age groups and then generate a report summarizing the most preferred food items. So basically, you have a baby food preferences or CSV. What you do, what the uh, code driven plan first does is it loads the CSV, then it performs stati statistical analysis using the stats analysis uh, API. Then it's generated a uh, report, like it's generated a build a histogram to you know visualize the preferences, and then it uh, selects some of the columns that might that it's want to include in its report, which includes age group, food item, and preference score, and then it's generated a summary report using the knowledge summary. 
So basically, we generated function signature of load CSV state analysis based is and knowledge summary uh, from the their API description that would have been provided, and then you use port event plan to successfully perform planning. So here, the thing is, you are not doing any traversal. You are doing in a one go using code generation, and you are not actually executing APIs in each step. The code will finally be generated later on. So uh, this is an end-to-end -end pipeline of our system. We named it Swiss Knife. So basically, here you can see is that uh, it's a function descriptions, uh, API descriptions, different API description, and then it's a function signature which is generated. So basically, for this, uh, what reflection is sometimes what happens that is generated function signature might not be syntactically correct. There might be some Python related error or issue. So what we do is after generating the function signature, we you know execute it to just see if there is an error or something. If there is an error, the original function signature and the error is given to the LLM and it does self-reflection and refine its you know uh, response and generate a better function signature. So that's what self-reflection was. Uh, so first given the tool description, we generated function signature. And then this function signature formed the, our tool corpus. So this is the corpus. Now a user comes in and provides a query. You have your tool corpus. You have your query. Retriever brought in the relevant APIs. And then there is top gun. Basically, our code driven planning, we named it top gun, the whole code driven listening idea. And the code token then generated the code driven plan uh, for different scenarios. Again, uh, self reflection can happen here as well. There might be scenes, you know, there might be some syntax error in the code. So you want to execute it and make sure that code is syntactically correct. So you will execute it if there is some syntax related error or something, the LLM can refine it until the code is syntactically correct. And then you can pass it to, you know, uh, get in the user defined format or something. So that's how our whole system works. API description, function signature, purpose, retriever, bringing in the relevant tools, top gun, then uh, generating the code driven plan, which is, you know, defined if there are syntax errors or something, and then uh, you return the, uh, the plan in a specific user defined format using a parser or something. How does evaluation happen in black box scenarios? So current evaluation or benchmark don't mimic such real world scenarios. And basically they use this white box setting only. So if you want to, if you look at you look at any benchmark or something, what they basically do is execution based evaluation. And they will find the match the final answers. So basically, if all the conditions or the sub goals are fulfilled or not. So what happens in our case will be the code driven plan is generated in black box setting. We are not executing APIs or something while generating the code plan, but uh, sadly for the evaluation. Uh, criteria you have to perform evaluation only but you can only perform evaluation by executing the APIs. So plan is generated in offline setting and evaluated in offline online setting in real time by executing those APIs. I hope in future you know we are able to create simulations of this real world scenarios where you know you can perform evaluation just not by matching the final answer but also by recognizing these real world concerns as well. Oh, now look at a token comparison. So for cost efficiency, you want to make sure that your approach don't use a lot of token. So if you want to take a look at React, uh, so the output token of React is too high. It's like around, it's in a log scale. Uh, the token count uh, work going up at after. So we used to showcase in the log scale. So it's around 10.24k. For token, since it's generating a code only and it's not, you know, traversing or anything, that uh, token count, output token count is low. For reverse scene, it's um, much less, but again, for it, it requires a lot of input. So basically, you are doing at least step, you are doing uh, function filling and everything. So it accounts for more input token as compared to top gun. So the total token of the code uh, top gun is a code driven approach. It is a bit less compared to reverse scene. Uh, TFS DT was another traversal based approach uh, for tool planning that was introduced in tool bench paper. Uh, it's a very good paper. It was one of the first prominent uh, tool benchmark to, for evaluating tool LLM agents. But again, DFSDT is something similar to tree of thought. You, if you want to combine tree of thought with React, I think that's what you get as DFSDT. But it has a very high token count. It's just exhaustive exploration. So its token count is very high, which is most costly. So you can see is that a code human reasoning doesn't just solve your concern of, you know, uh, real world scenarios where you are 
can't execute API or you have sensitivity concern, but as well, it's more cost uh, effective as well. Uh, so the conclusion of the presentation is that as we develop new existing methodologies and develop uh, an explore the domain of cool LLM agents, it's also important to take into account this real world concern. Uh, and we also should focus on that how our research can be applied in these scenarios where you know we have to take into account the factors such as privacy or cost effectiveness. Also, it will be great that you know future evaluations can uh, mimic such scenarios, and there are different uh, and like we can evaluate methodologies moving beyond traditional evaluations such as final answer accuracy, etc. We can take into account these scenarios as well. Uh, Again, uh, thank you. So this was a presentation. Uh, I want to conclude with the thing that actually the whole idea of real world scenarios and when you are taking part in a really prestigious competition, and there was a company which a startup which uh, presented us with building a tool LLM agent, and they never gave an access to their APIs or something because we were an external engineers to them. They wanted that you bring in the solution. We we won't be giving you know the access to the APIs or something because of the privacy and we want a cost efficient approach. So basically, this whole thing actually happened because I was in that scenario. You know, I was in that place where a company had some privacy and sensitivity API issues, and they wanted an approach which does the whole planning in black box setting itself. Uh, again, uh, okay, so. That's all from the presentation side. If anyone want to ask anything, you can go ahead. Yeah, thanks for, for the talk. Uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, they can ask in the mic or they can also write in the chat as well. So. OK, I'll just uh, stop the screen sharing so I can get the chat. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so we. Do have one question from Matthew. Uh, you can read the question, and I think he asked this question uh, when um, we were yeah. showing the the black yeah, box test. No, actually, I haven't looked at the swagger so open it. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you tell? Me? I think it's not there. Yeah, I think Matthew dropped. Uh, yeah, thank you too. But, but yeah, I remember he asked this question around like the black box testing slide that you were showing. Yeah, but uh, I think it's uh, actually I went I went looked at the documentation. I'll look at it. Okay, I have one question as well. So in the yeah. diagram for like the Swiss knife architecture. Knife. Yeah, there were like two like uh, places where Python code could be like generated, and and my question was like, so there is of course like reflection happening over there, but is there there's also like a possibility that like some malicious code could also be uh, generated at some time point and. Uh, like the task of the reflection is that it looks at the generated code and it looks for those. Errors. I haven't thought about malicious code in as such. Like, can you explain a bit what you mean by malicious code? Like, so, uh, I would say like malicious code, like something like that doesn't conform with the with the function definition. Like, it's uh, oh, like okay. very much different from the. Yeah. So, like, what we have, I've seen in our experience that. Uh, LLMs are very good at function calling where with code while well, they are generating the codes. Like you can think that function calling is inherited in the code generation. So basically, it's one of the key thing if, while you are generating a code. So actually, they are very good at it. But yeah, uh, it's malicious can happen. So that's what you have self reflection for. It can look at its response, can see for any errors or something, and it can refine you know its response and generate a better code. So that's what reflection is for. But again, for that, it needs to get some hint or some feedback that uh, the code is not correct or something. So for that, you can execute the code. Again, since the APIs are not the pseudo APIs or dummy APIs only, they don't give you API response.
right you can just check the syntax of the code if it's syntactically correct or not so the reflection is not about taking the getting the api response it's about the structure of the code whether the code structures adheres to the user query or not but again i think that's a very interesting point to make but in my uh, accuracy or anything that we have saw, so saw on our benchmarks was that code generation is very good at adhering to the user query while filling, while uh, choosing the relevant APIs and calling them. Better than you know, React or any other approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I will be sharing the slides with you as well, right? Yeah, that, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, like it will be hosted yeah. somewhere. If you uh, want, I'll you share maybe, it with you. Yeah, you can share it right now as well, maybe. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll. Uh, should I share in DM or you know? Yeah, you can so, uh, share it in the message. Yeah, I did. Did you receive? Uh, let me check. Uh, one, one second. Yeah. Yeah, now I see it and let me try opening it. Perfect, I, I can access these slides. Okay. I think if anyone doesn't have any question, you can Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks. Thanks oh, for hosting. Okay. Yeah. Thanks to, for taking your time yeah. on Saturday. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. Bye, good Thank night. You. Okay, it's night here, so I'll say good night.